became a supervisor uh, at, at a uh, farm company, if you will, a land company. Uh, and she spoke mainly Spanish, obviously, uh, because her, her, her parents were not well educated by any means. Uh, they barely got to primaria, for those of you who know something about the educational system of Mexico. Um, so she went to school deficient in her English, English proficiency, but she was lucky three times. She was lucky that a Canadian who was teaching in the school district of that valley town at the time, who had come uh, under a, a, an exchange program with the United States to go to underserved areas of the United States in order to teach, in his case, to teach third grade. And he pushed her, not only to in excel in her ability to acquire English, but in every other way pushed her to believe that she could, quote unquote, go much further. And then a second stroke of luck. She had a fifth grade teacher who similarly pushed her, pushed her hard. And she worked hard in order to reach those standards established by that fifth grade teacher. And her third break was the fact that <clears throat> her older brother, pushed her even harder, even though he would have to wait many years for himself to go to college. So when she graduated from high school, she was one of two members of C, what is the California Scholarship Federation, CSF. Um, and of course, uh, there were a lot of her friends who never got to the end of the road, if you will, to graduate, much less become members of the California Scholarship Federation. But her brother, and she came, she maintained contact with her fifth grade teacher, maintained contact with her third grade teacher who had moved back to Canada. And they encouraged her to go to a top university, and she did. She went to law school. <clears throat> And after various stints as a lawyer and for a private firm, a short stint in the Superior Court here in California, she was nominated by uh, President Biden to be the first Latina of the district, Eastern District of the state of California, which goes all the way from Northern California all the way down to the border, the east side of the state. What an incredible story. What an incredible woman in, in that respect, given all of the deficits, not only of being a Latina, not only getting to school, low income and all of that. And she has pictures of their first house. It's about half the size of this room here. To be able to go to a prestigious law school and as I said, be nominated uh, and she was approved to be that first Latina of the Eastern District Court, Federal Court of the state of California. She, her office is now in Fresno, Judge Ana de Alba is her name, which some of you perhaps read about her appointment uh, in, um, uh, in the Fresno Bee or, or the Visalia Times Delta, I don't know. But you know, at one, point, at one level, we can say, wow, what progress. What an incredible success story. The first this, in this case, a Latina, the first at Latino astronaut, the first this and the first that. 174 years after the end of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, we are still talking about first. First this, first that. Why did it, why has it taken so long? And if you want to go back to 769, <laughs> add a few more years in that respect. So rhetorically, when uh, Nancy and I and others were involved, well, what are we going to call this exhibit? 
we kind of gravitated immediately toward the term caminos. But then how are we going to tell the story, which was a huge, huge discussion. And perhaps most, most importantly, because most people kind of gravitate toward the end of the story when it comes to museum histories uh, and this sort of thing, what are we going to say at the end? Are we there yet? That's what we ended up, a question mark. With all of these aspects of progress, yet nonetheless, we still have first, if you will. So today I'm going to run through some slides. Forgive me, Armando. Uh, to try to answer that question, are we there yet? And if not, under what circumstances uh, it, has there been a delay, let us say? Uh, in, quote unquote, getting there. Because the progress is very impressive, if you stop and think about it. And some of us here, well, I don't see, and see anybody here my age, but some of you may remember, all right, when there wasn't anyone that had a PhD. When I got here, there were three PhDs in the entire Central Valley who were of Mexican descent. And my generation, everybody talked about the, the especially Mexican, uh, you know, I use the term Latino, um, nonetheless, generically here, the Latino dropout rate. And when I first went to college at Fresno State, uh, what, that was the big issue, that 40, 50, depending on what high school, didn't even graduate. And there was a project at Fresno State, it was called Project 17. 17 high school students that were going to be taken to Fresno State to see if they could finish their degrees. And I suspect many of you here, if not all of you here, are examples of that incredible jump that some of us were able to make. But like in the story of Judge Ana de Alba, oftentimes it was almost a stroke of luck. It was good fortune almost an accident in that respect. And for my cohort uh, at, um, at Madera High School, there were 125 Mexicans. I knew at least half of them when we started as freshmen. By the time high school graduation, four of us applied to go to college. All four of us got in, but only two graduated from college. And I'm the only one that went on to get a PhD. Now, I don't say that to brag. I say that in the context of why did it take so long? And we are still having first, if you will. Again, if you look at the data, look at the statistics and so on, and as I mentioned in the handout, we have made huge jumps whether it's in the amount of money that Latinos spend in the state of California, which means, of course, we spent a lot of taxes, all right, uh, sort of thing, uh, et cetera. And, and in, the, in the handout, I mentioned some of those, including the fact that Fresno State, in the last graduation cohort of what they call Latino graduation, 65% of the Latino kids who graduated from Fresno State were first-generation students, the first ones in their family to go to college, kind of like Manuel Soto and his story when he was here uh, last time uh, to, give, uh, <clears throat> to be a discussant on, on, on the panel for today's second hour session. In that regard, but think about how many generations we are talking about. If we go back to, say, the late 19th century, early part of the 20th century, that's a lot of generations, at least three. And in my wife's family, five generations. I'll, I'll leave that up in the air. How could that happen? It did. So um, this is one of the key points I want to emphasize. I've done this before. And so I'm going to gloss over some of the key points here uh, in that respect. But uh, th this is one way of understanding the progress. And it is incredible, including 
when you stop and think of, of this, pardon me, of the $17 billion being sent to relatives in Mexico in addition to all the other figures in this slide. So yes, there's been a great deal of progress. But if we stop and look at the aggregate, at the whole of the Latino population, there is some wanting, if you will, in that respect. So there are a variety of factors that explain some of this. Um, last time we talked about politics here in the Valley in light of the, uh, in light of the recent elections and so on. So I'm not going to speak too much of, uh, uh, on that first point. Uh, it was covered, I think, very well in that discussion. Uh, and certainly, we have a long way to go. Just think about the naturalization rate of Latinos who are eligible to naturalize. Mexicans have the lowest rate of naturalization in the country. So we're not there yet, at least on the question of naturalization. And I want to remind us that this color here, the green, it keeps going up. It didn't stop in 1930. It didn't stop during World War II. It didn't stop in the 1960s, etc. We're the only racial ethnic group that has that pattern of migration. The blue, the Europeans came and went. Some came later, a few came later, but nowhere with the magnitude of what had happened early on for reasons that I explained in the first platica. But uh, so there is a demographic shift. You all know it. It's in the newspapers and so forth, especially a bunch of stories that came out soon after the uh, US Census figures uh, and so on. And Tulare County is not the only county. The same thing happened in Stanislaus, in San Joaquin, not to mention the core of the valley, Merced, Madera, Fresno, Kings, Tulare, and you all know that. But is this number, is the aggregate number, because we're lumping together all those grandchildren or great-grandchildren of those who came in the early part of the 20th century, and we're putting those together with the first, second, third, fourth generation and the children, their progeny, if you will. And all of us know this. There's a difference. My nephews, fourth generation, they can barely get through the Taco Bell menu. Their Spanish is so bad. And then there are those at the opposite end who, go, who work at Taco Bell. And the only language you hear in the back is in Spanish. And I don't know about you, but in the Bay Area, almost every restaurant I go to, even some of the Chinese restaurants, there are Mexicanos working there. Okay? I don't know if they know how to cook with woks, but they're there. Okay? <clears throat> so, again, the distinctive pattern here. Look what happened to European migration. Overwhelmingly, the dominant force in terms of migration into the, pardon me, into the United States. And there's some examples as to why. And then this. But this corresponds to that green color that I mentioned earlier, not coming from Europe overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly coming from Latin America, overwhelmingly coming from Mexico. So here's another way of understanding it. Some of you may recall, if you were here for the first platica, that's Italian migration. Boom, bam, se acabó, almost. But in the case of Mexicanos, Otra vez, otra vez, otra vez, crossing the border. It's a different story. It's not just the immigrant story that too often in the past was a narrative in our U.S. history books with all kinds of implications and languages as one of them. Everybody talks about, oh, you speak Spanish very well. Can you write a letter for me? Ay, bueno, ahí cabe. Okay, right? Like my mother didn't finish elementary school in Mexico. She could speak Spanish, but she could not write. She could not read the novels of Carlos Fuentes with any kind of proficiency and so on. So this notion, when you see it in the census, what is a language spoken at home? The percentage here in Tulare County is very high. But if you put in parentheses, what is the level 
of literacy in writing and reading, ahí se acabó. Because a lot of Mexicans come speaking Spanish, and many non-Spanish speakers are very impressed by our Spanish. But then when we have to write a long letter. So we have all of these slides all over California, now more and more in textbooks. Híjuela, look at them. And the color, by the way, I, got, I did that on purpose. OK? <laughs> all right. And again, the, river, the reverberations of this history of migration is reflected more and more in the Central Valley. And this pie chart, if you go back, and I wish I had the time here to go back to all the pie charts for Tulare County, but you know that's the irony about being a Mexican and being counted, is no one put us in the census except once, as I mentioned in the last handout, in 1930, where they tried to count us. And then we had to wait till 1980 again to be counted. So we were put under the white category with all of the imp what contradictions involved. Now, why do I put this in here? Because that is part of the context of that migration. And I, this is just one that I can put up. And that is that each migratory flow in one way or another had to confront really bad economic times. So that flow at the beginning of the century, boom, ran into the depression. And then the group that came in the 40s and 50s, boom, the end of the Bracero program with all of its implications socially, culturally, and so forth and so on. So the Azteca Theater in Fresno became a casualty of that change when it closed. Not because there was a lack of Spanish speaking people, but because they found a substitute. It was called Univision, the Spanish International Network, and now we have three of them, so to speak. And then came other points in that history where once again, it hit Latinos. Whether one was second generation or third generation, and hopefully not someone who had just arrived and was picking oranges in Orange Cove. And why is that important? Because of generational wealth. And generational wealth is not just a matter of the money that you have, but the knowledge that you can manipulate. And in that respect, this is one of the points in, in, in the handout, is the ability to advance is getting harder in this country. We can debate why, and I'd be happy in the Q&A to respond to your questions in that respect, and perhaps uh, Elena Nava can comment on that as well. But the important point here is, if you are born poor, there's a 40 plus percent chance that you will be poor when you're an adult. If you're born into money, there's a good chance you're still gonna have many. Maybe not as much as your father, uh, I don't know, Elon Musk, does he have kids? I don't know, but I won't comment on that. But the point being, okay, the point being that if you're middle class, it's also getting harder to get your child, for example, into that upper echelon. And that this is a national scene. This is a Stanford study. And the point is this, it's getting harder. Even getting a BA isn't necessarily a guarantee. And I remember in the old days, they would come and they put a, a, a graph or a table. If you graduate from college, you'll be making this much. Híjola. That's a big thing. And now, it's not always the case. Now, this is for California. Igual. If you are in the bottom quintile, it's going to be harder to get over here. Maybe you might get here. But notice the middle. Even for the middle class, it's not hard. I mean, it's not easy to jump to here. This is just one way of measuring what now sociologists and anthropologists are calling inclusion, a sense of belonging, that you're not always going to be on the margins. Um, and this is one of the worst things that's happened to the more recent immigrants, independent of what happened in the 30s. 
or what happened in the middle of the 50s. Remember Operation Wetback? You might remember that platica for those of you who came uh, in, in that respect. So uh, it really hit a lot of Mexicanos hard all over the country and especially in areas like the Central Valley. So those are the numbers just for California. 48% of the people who lost their homes were Latinos. People who had household wealth, and for a lot of Latinos, it was having your own little house, two bedrooms, a backyard, a front yard, if you were lucky, maybe one of those plastic swimming pools in the back. And in that regard, the where before it was 18,000. For some, maybe it was 150,000. But then the value of their homes, the value of their assets, basically their house went down 30% and so forth. And uh, the, I could do a whole lecture on the impact of the financial crisis of 2008 through 2012 and what it meant for Latinos, but um, don't have the time here. And it impacted Mexican migration. Why? Because the overwhelming majority of Mexican immigrants come here to work. The labor force uh, participation rate of Latinos is the highest in this country. And the same thing is in California. Or if I can go back to the 80s, people are not coming here to get on welfare. They're coming here to work. But what happens in the Central Valley? What does that work mean? What does that translate to in terms of wages and opportunities uh, and so on? And here in Tulare County, for unauthorized immigrants, you can see where they're at. And there's an echo. I don't know how many of you read that article in the Fresno Bee a couple of days ago. And it's not surprising. Job growth is taking place in the Central Valley. But what kinds of jobs? And if you read the article, not a lot of them are quote unquote, high paying jobs. So how do you get out of this into something else? Dark Brown, Tulare County, one of the counties where mobility is least possible, least possible. So this is the context into which those immigrants whose grandchildren or children in the 50s and 60s were part of my cohort and didn't graduate from high school, or if they did, they ended up not going to college for one reason or another. And we see then a recycling of the limitations of opportunity that is taking place. So then, I mean, there's a reason why the National Restaurant Association has constantly been pushing immigration reform. Because guess who are the restaurant workers? A lot of them are immigrants, and a lot of them are immigrants from Latin America, and a whole bunch of them are from Mexico. Latino, native-born, non-native born. So we still have a lot of kids, if you will, who are still here or here, as opposed to being at the top tiers. And for non-native who are foreign born, it's even harder to get to that top tier. So that's what I'm going to emphasize here today. And I give you examples in the handout. And that is the issue of education because it is the one horse that everyone likes to beat up. It's the bad teachers. It's the bad school. It's a bad educational leadership. The school board doesn't care about us, whatever. And we can debate that issue. But the important point, the important point, and it's included in the handout. Once again, there's an effort to recognize the reality. And that is that the educational pipeline which includes other measures of 
economic social mobility. And there are others. I'm just taking the issue of education in part because the literature overwhelmingly argues that the best indicator, and that's why UC Berkeley changed its admissions policies, not because I was on the committee, but I was the chair of the committee. It changed its admission policies because there was not a good correlation between SAT scores and academic success at Berkeley. The most important factor, it turns out, from all of our members of our committee, uh, we asked the STAT, the School of Ed, et cetera, the major, the major source of educational success was the level of education of the parents. That was the most important. And that made it a whole lot easier for children to be successful in elementary school, pardon me, middle school, high school, uh, et cetera, including, including academic success. Because we analyzed the high schools that had this great reputation uh, and so on in very affluent suburbs of the state of California. And we found all kinds of things. For example, AP courses. EP, EP, AP courses count more in terms of racking up points to get into the UC system now. But what happens if you have a high school where there's only two AP courses? Maybe you're lucky. You get to have six or seven, which, by the way, is the average here in Tulare County. And you compare that with a school, not one of the wealthy schools in the northern um, area edge, if you will, now because it's all the way to the San Joaquin River, uh, of Fresno and so on, that has 15 AP courses. And then you get to the Bay Area. And there's a high school in Marin County that has 30 AP courses. And here in the Valley, if you only have three AP courses and only 30 students can get in the class with no guarantee that it's going to be repeated just either one semester or the other semester because teacher X has to teach AP history, but he can only do it once sort of thing. OK. So. Um, here we have another report, just like Nancy and I, back in the 60s and 70s, we saw report after report. We got to improve the education of Latinos. So here we are, otra vez. And luckily, we live in a bubble. When things are good, California will give money to the underserved. And Gavin Newsom, just a few months ago, signed off on that $18 million grant that I mentioned in the handout. Now, why do I use 2011? Because if, we, if you recall, we talked about that surge of the 80s and the 90s. We talked about IRCA and how that added to the surge, because then green card holders could bring their immediate relatives here to the United States and so on. So that's why I use 2011 because we're talking now of the children of that surge, whether it was in Tulare County or the state of California, et cetera. So you can see the difference. So we are not only trying to catch up with the children and their deficits, educationally that is, but also having to deal with that surge and the children of that surge when it comes to educational attainment. And California, for all the reasons that I mentioned, including how beautiful the people are in this state, as opposed to the ugly people in Texas. OK, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know some of you are from Texas. All right. It's not your fault that you got cosmetic surgery in order to get into California. All right. Uh, sort of thing. All right. OK. Um, and in this regard, then, uh, we're talking about this surge, this surge and how we're going to integrate this surge but integrate it in a way that the children involved are going to have a more equitable opportunity. I say more equitable opportunity to take their gifts and their talents and their intelligence and translate it into the kind of progress where we can say at the end of an exhibit, maybe 10 years from now and so on, we are here. Or as I like to say, aquí estamos y no nos vamos.
But unfortunately, and some of you were here when there was a demonstration here at COS over the whole question of DACA and so on. There are people who don't want to invest in this new surge of migration, and some people don't even want to invest at all in anyone from coming from particular countries and so on, or of religious backgrounds or gender preferences. And we're holding our breath as to what's going to happen. And the Supreme Court will have a big say on that, just like a recent uh, case currently up before uh, the Supreme Court over the question of representation and state legislatures. OK. Despite the fact that the majority of Americans are more than willing to provide a pathway to citizenship. And this is one of the political economic questions that um, I, I can't speak about because I, I just don't have the time. But to some extent, we started that conversation uh, last time. So again, to put it bluntly, we still have these graphs telling us the economic payoff in this sort of thing. And believe me, uh, given the way I grew up, and I know some of you enough to know the way you grew up and this sort of thing, whew, our parents cannot believe it. And I'm sure some of you have relatives or you yourselves, you remember that time where you put on the refrigerator, mija got the best blah, blah, blah in the third grade, right? Mijo got the best blah, blah, blah in junior high for this academic um, uh, field and, and so forth and so on. And some of you remember that incredible excitement because in the old days they sent it to you by mail when you opened up and it was a thick envelope from Berkeley, from Stanford, from UCLA and so on. Right? Or better yet, it came in your daughter's name or your son's name and you heard a squeal in the bedroom. Assuming she has her own bedroom, <laughs> okay. Well, isn't that a great feeling for, the, for some of you who are aunts, uncles, etc., to have that kind of story? Absolutely. And it feels good. When I teach at Berkeley, I always ask, how many of you have come from the Central Valley? Once in a while, I get one or two hands. And I'll ask, where are you from? Um, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Fresno. Oh, really? Fresno, Fresno? Well, no, not really. Because they're embarrassed, because they assume no one knows where Kerman is, much less Mendota or Farbaugh or something like that. And if they come from Tulare County, they always say they're from around Visalia. Around Visalia? Sort of thing. Because inevitably, somebody will turn to them, where, where is that? It's near this. Oh, really? That's great. When the hell is it? And this is, again, one of the problematics when we go to the political economy. There's a reason why Gavin Newsom is able to give $18 million or sign off on, on the legislation and so on, because we have such a big surplus. But some of you remember when that surplus wasn't there before. And some of you remember the cutbacks. And among, unfortunately, the areas we cut back on was education. And we started to have a bigger and bigger gap between what was needed and what was available before this more recent good times. So the increases went up. At the same time, because of declining mobility, the income and wealth inequity in this country got bigger, not less, as I suspect all of you know only too well. And then we started to add fees to try and make up the difference. And so now the real cost of going to UC Berkeley, UCLA, UC Davis, UC Merced, whatever, all right, you pay fees. It's a way of using students in order to lessen the gaps. And what happened recently in Fresno, the 
Fresno voters would not give more money to deal with the dilapidated state of several buildings on the campus. But I suspect the current president is gonna try one more time because the state budget, as big as it is, and with the increases that have taken place is still not enough. So state spending on higher education has not reached pre-recession levels. We're still playing catch up with higher education. The deficit at UC Berkeley right now is $110 million. And it's even bigger for um, a couple of the bigger campuses. So yes, there's been a great deal of progress. If you look way over to the left, but some folks arrive with certain advantages that allows for them to have even much greater success. And, and part of that baggage, as all of you know, like with the H, uh, uh, H uh, program uh, for computer programmers and so forth and so on, they over, overwhelmingly come from a certain part of the world. It makes it a whole lot easier to get into, into this bar graph at the top levels. So we've seen these signs before. For some of us, que nuevas, que nuevas. When they told us to assimilate, when the Association of Mexican American Educators, with Nancy being one of the firebrands at that time, who uh, continues to spit out embers over this issue uh, in that respect, dual immersion, dual, en dual enrollment programs, all of these ideas are not new. But there are certain counties that are behind. And one of them is Madera County, and one of them is Tulare County. Only 20% as of 2019, only 20% of students have available dual enrollment programs in the county. The signs definitely are better than they were in the past, okay? But for some folks, for some folks, their attitudes remain the same. So we're in the midst of this surge here in Tulare County, in the state of California in particular, for the re reason that I mentioned earlier in the slide. So many of the immigrants have gravitated to this state for a lot of different reasons. If you want, we can, we can debate that. But the important point is, what are we gonna do with this surge of immigrants so that their process of integration, now we call it belonging and inclusion, will have much better results than what we have found in the past. So for Tulare County, my home county of Madera, this is one of the real questions. Where do you go? What kinds of jobs are available? Becoming the night manager at uh, Sonic Hamburgers, one of my nieces. She was so happy. She was making $30,000 a year. Now she's struggling through business school, but that's another issue. To repeat, for some people, it's really tough to get out. And for some people, it's a whole lot easier to stay at the top. So here, um, in places like the Central Valley, because so many high school students come underprepared, their major, and this is still true in the state of California, the overwhelming majority of Latino young people are in community colleges if they go to college at all, overwhelmingly. But in the handout, as you will note, the community colleges uh, often are not in a position to be successful in terms of getting their students out the door and transfer. All of the community colleges in this region, the transfer rate is in single digits. It could 6%, it's 4%, and so on. The graduation rate is 28 to 30%. That means 70% do not graduate. And hopefully this grant is going to really up those numbers. 
Um, and I wish I could talk about this one. But I just took a couple of figures from Porterville College and COS. Now, some of my female colleagues say, well, that just shows you who the superior species is, OK, uh, sort of thing. But this is, is an issue and is becoming a bigger issue for the reasons I mentioned earlier. If the overwhelming majority of Latino students who do even make an effort to go to college, which is a community college, then this has long-term consequences. And great for Latinas. But it would be nice if there was more equity of success between, young, uh, between women and men who are Latinos. So the numbers, as you can see, to get to UC, for Latinos as a whole. Now, if you break it down by second, third, fourth generation, undoubtedly, it would look different. But we're still trying to, in a sense, process, digest, integrate, call it what you will, that surge of migration, which pulls down, in a manner of speaking, much of this curve. And yes, things are getting better. But given the statistics that I have in the handout, there's a whole lot more room for improvement. And the proof of the Camino and where it's going, the question still is there. Are we there yet? And I would say we have a long way to go. Thank you very much for those of you who have come more than once. Thank you very much for your presence here today. On the drive over here, I said, mm, las moscas are going to be here today because it was raining so hard up in the Bay Area. So thank you very much for being here. And now I'll take a few Q&A questions before our panelists uh, are, um, uh, are up in, after a break. We'll, we'll have a panel discussion. So um, how much time do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? OK. I'll extend it. Well, I'll see. Yes, please. Question. Yes, if vocational education is not the old style, because I was put in the vocational track when I got to high school. Uh, I don't know why, because I had very good grades, but I was in auto shop, wood shop, electrical shop, and so on. So after I, I almost electrocuted half the class, right? And then after I, I still have the scar, I, I cu cut my arm really bad. Luckily, I didn't get the, the artery and this sort of thing. and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was a disaster. So I went to my counselor and I told her, I think I'm in the wrong track. All right. And the rest is history. But if we're talking about vocational college, that is talking about high skill, technical skills. But the fact remains, and all of us know this, that when it comes to vocational ed, that gender balance goes in the other way. More men are involved in those classes. But the fact remains, do they graduate? And the answer is, the graduation rate is still very low. The transfer rate of uh, Santa Ana College, very similar to this, um, demographically to the community colleges here in, in this area. High percentage of Latinos, high percentage of undocumented students. It's a sanctuary city and all of that sort of stuff, all right? And the transfer rate, is 8% as opposed to 4%. And um, the average for community colleges in terms of transfer rate is almost 17%. So Tulare County, Madera, uh, et cetera, really have a long jump to even get average in that respect. But the educational pipeline doesn't start there, right? They are dealing with the consequences of that pipeline that still needs a great deal of repair. Okay. Any other questions? I've stunned you into silence. That's uh, what I was afraid of. Okay, for Porterville College is going to turn it around in the next five years, and the transfer rate will quadruple. Of course, yes, Professor. Uh huh.
terms of uh, jumping to Trump, mm -hmm. we skip over the Obama administration and the mass deportation. And some people that I know personally, friends, family, mm -hmm. from the Mexican community, I mean, the, the impact, the, the biggest impact in the, the deportation was from the Obama administration. But it seems that the, the Latino leadership oftentimes is now being criticized. Right. Well, in the platic on the handout, I, maybe uh, you weren't here that day, but uh, I made it very clear that when Clinton and then Obama painted themselves into a corner in order to blunt the criticism that Democrats were for open borders and so on, they increased the budget of the Border Patrol, increased the budget of what became uh, the Department uh, of um, DHS. Anyway. Um, Homeland Security, uh, et cetera. So in that sense, and as you, we know, President Biden has not canceled um, the uh, protocol number 42, et cetera. So no, the Democrats are not off the hook in that respect, all right? Uh, and um, in my class, I always, uh, as I tell my class, look, I voted for, for President Obama twice and I would do it again on a heartbeat if that, if that would ever be possible. But that doesn't mean I agree with all of the policies, not only of him, but of any Democrat on the question of immigration. And by the way, it was his bad luck, of course, uh, to have a, con a congressional situation where Republicans dominated Congress, which made everything you know, much steeper to get anything done. And it looks like we're going to be getting there. Not for two years, and everyone, including me, said, do it now. Do it now. Get that neck. I mean, metaphorically, <laughs> all right, and do it. So, but uh, for reasons that he tries to explain, uh, President Obama decided not to do it. And then, as he puts it, he got a shellacking in the midterms of 2010. And after that, it was all uphill, all uphill. Um, let's see, I thought there was some other hand, but okay. But would you have it? Okay, Eddie, yes. Yes, so I wanted to go back to the concern that you raised about equity between Latinos and Latinas. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in the early 2000s, there was a huge push to get Latinas into higher ed, to get Latinas in STEM. Uh, in doing so, however, there's been a decline in Latinos going on to college. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I started a nonprofit before I became county supervisor, Young Men's Initiative, knowing that there's a fatherless generation mm -hmm. occurring in our communities uh, statewide, even maybe nationwide. And so what is it that we need to do to make sure that there is more equity? I know that currently you have like HOPE, which is the organization that tries mm -hmm. to get Latinas into political office, uh, but how can we work together to make sure that we leave no one behind? Well. I think the key word is together, where all of the actors involved in that larger question, and it's been a question for a long time, parentheses, 37% of the children born in this country in 2019 came from families where there was only one parent. So it is a national issue. And among African Americans, Asian Americans, we did the study at Berkeley, in every measure, even Asians, higher GPA, higher college level completion, higher going on to uh, a master's or, or PhD. It didn't matter. Women were outdoing men, all right? So it's not a Latino issue. It is a much larger issue. And in that respect, that's what I mean by together. It's going to be, or has to be, in my opinion, a multi-level, multi-pronged approach. And we continue to dump everything on the schools in a manner of speaking. And I believe it has to go beyond that. And that's why, for me, the issue of civic engagement is so important. And one of the reasons I invited uh, Elena Nava, the president of the League of Mexican American Women, to come to this, because civic engagement, whether it's in the form of uh, supporting a particular candidate who's going to, quote unquote, do something in the ways that Lucia tried to do when she was on the school board here, uh, et cetera, or basically taking orders from not Lali over there and Tulare and this sort of thing. This is what you need to do sort of thing. I mean, the, the ingredients are there, but like all types of efforts of that sort, you need people who are equally 
and in some cases even more than that, equally invested in the idea of success. And until we get that, if it's all coming from one person and one organization, the Latinos, the blah, 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 and this sort of thing. Meanwhile, the educational leadership is over here. The community says, oh my God, they want everything on a silver platter, whatever, all right? And there has to be a sense that any investment in human capital is good for all children. And as I put in the platica, white children, black children, Asian children, who go to these high schools in Tulare County, they are underserved as well. And you would think that the community here would like to see a high transfer rate from COS, as opposed to Bakersfield State or Fresno State, think higher. And that's why I started with that story, because she was gonna to apply to Fresno State. That was gonna be the big jump, and her brother, and her old teacher said, no, go for it, go for it. And it was luck. She said, okay, I'll apply. And if I may be personal here, that's what I did. When I applied to Harvard, I did it almost on a lark, almost on a lark. And when I got that thick envelope, wow. But, and again, not to brag, but I remember the Madeira Tribune, front page, Madeira boy to go to Harvard. My mother, of course, you know, bought more newspapers that day than ever in her life, right? uh, sort of thing. And, um, and you know, I, I, I didn't like being the first one. And as I became a historian, even less did I like, you know. And as I tell my students, the first woman to get on the Supreme Court, remember that? I'm sure some of the women here remember that. And rhetorically, I asked my students, how long have women been around? Okay, so that's what I mean. I mean, it takes the community colleges and there are these programs like dual enrollment is taking place, but a very small proportion of students are doing it, for example. Secondly, it involves teachers who are invested in using those $18 million to improve their performance as well as the performance of their students. It's gonna take educational leadership top to bottom, to say, we got to do something. Because even the non-Latinos are getting ticked off that my kid didn't get into Berkeley, and they had this, and they had that, and so forth. Okay? And, and that's, what, that's what I think it's going to have to take. And you know, that's the mantra of the UC system and Cal State, uh, et cetera, is making it possible for kids who do have the gifts, who do have the talent, to really be able to utilize that talent, those gifts, intelligence, and so on. That's the payoff of getting those kids to have that equity. Then everyone wins, sort of thing. And I'll just share, Ana de Alba was my dad's attorney 10 years ago when he was unjustly terminated from work. Okay. And Ana de Alba was one of my students at Berkeley. Okay. Question. Yeah, um, there's so much there, but like, I was, you mentioned that the that recategorization of white, um, mm -hmm. as I understand, when the Europeans started coming here, they made distinction, and then when other foreigners started coming, then they bundled them up, and then now they're bundling them up to the Latinos, which is causing the confusion. And so, with that, this change mm -hmm. of categorization, I wonder where, if we're not going to be bold, and, and in consideration of, you know, these, um, where the taxes go, the low level of drug offenses, where people are constantly put in, put in jail, and all these roadblocks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, if we're not going to be bold enough to say that, that it's outright conspiratorial, um, like, where can, can we recognize acknowledge that it's a little bit more than coincidence and I would like to invoke the word um, it, my concern revolving on these kinds of discussions is um, you know that nationality is, mm -hmm. is takes precedent uh, no matter what we like to say about you know the positive part of the stuff and, and I, I just believe that the word uh, replacement law is needed. Well there's a lot in your question but let me try to answer as briefly as possible because um, I do want 
our discussants to have an opportunity to speak as well. Um, um, some of you, if not most of you, are of a certain age where the issue of these deficits that I've raised here, educational and others, like uh, the disproportionate number who are going to prison, disproportionate number who have uh, or get longer sentences for the same kind of crime, et cetera, et cetera. All those there, that's nothing new. And it's unfortunate that it took somebody with, um, you know, to, to die with a, a policeman uh, with his, a knee on his neck and so on. And believe me, I'm not trying to say that all police and so forth and so on are racist and so on. Quite the contrary. Um, some of my relatives are in law enforcement and believe me, they're not racist. But the important point here is that this is an old story, but as a nation, as a nation, or if you want to put it as, as a state, or if you want to be even more specific, as a county of this state, we can no longer go, to, uh, go through another era of a textbook that I had to read when I was in graduate. It's called A History of Educational Neglect. When Euro Europeans, like Italians, like Irish, and so on, were racialized, as you well know, uh, and I mentioned it uh, in those uh, racist-based admission policies of the 1920s and so forth and so on. And the same language was being used. Well, you know, these Italians are criminally prone and they like to kill people with knives and so forth and so on. Some of you may remember the slide that I showed during that lecture, uh, etc. So I don't believe that there's a, nat a national conspiracy. There are and I had to take out a bunch of uh, slides here regarding hate crimes toward Latinos. And no doubt there's a strata of people that if tomorrow all the Latinos decided to go back to Venezuela, El Salvador, Nicaragua, not to mention Mexico, uh, there would be some people here who say, about time. All right, about time. But I don't think that's necessarily the case with the majority of the American electorate or the American public. And a good example is the slide that I gave regarding what to do about DACA students. And the majority say, give them a pathway to citizenship. Unfortunately, race works at times politically. It works. We call it the dog whistle. And you use euphemisms and so on in order to appeal to that particular group. And they have responded. They have responded, quote unquote, big time, whether they're called Oath Keepers or what is it, Proud Boys. Uh, I try not to read that stuff because I get really angry, um, as opposed to being impartial, academic, uh, and so on, uh, sort of thing. So uh, in my opinion, we're going through a very particular moment in this country and particularly in this state, because if you've been here long enough, that billion dollar, hundred billion dollar surplus that we have now, inevitably it's going to run into headwinds of one kind or another. And we won't have that largesse to spend another 18 million. And by the way, when you divide it up in terms of number of students and the number of schools that are going to share that 18 million, doesn't go very far. Doesn't go very far. So it's going to take an investment of a community and that's why it was so disappointing to see the vote on the tax measure to improve the buildings, not raising money for scholarships for low income, the buildings at my alma mater. That's where I got my BA, Fresno State. And without understanding the huge payoff of all, because those buildings, if we get them better, everybody wins. This is not being done for minorities. It's a winner. And it's really sad to have seen that measure go down by that, by that number of percentage points. It wasn't close in an electoral way. And the same thing has to happen here in Tulare County, I would argue. So thank you again for coming. I, I, I've talked way too much. I want to give our two distinguished panelists the opportunity to respond uh, to your questions. Uh, and we'll start the conversation, and it is intended to be a conversation, uh, and I trust that you will stick around. And again, 
Most of you, some of you have been here for all of my lectures. Some of you had a respite in that regard. But here I am at the end. And uh, thank you again very much on the part of Nancy Marquez, uh, who was the brainchild of this whole exhibit from the very beginning. And thank you very much for your presence here today. Thank you.
in that office, being part of his, being part of the community, uh, would definitely help us immensely. Eddie? Is the mic on? So try to speak louder. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I personally believe that as an optimist, uh, meaning that the glass is always full, not empty, um, that we do live in an area in which out of 465 to 470,000 uh, people in this county, 300,000 plus are Latino. Uh, the concern that I have is that of that, when it comes to representation, I am the only Latino that serves on the Board of Supervisors, uh, which has been a challenge. I will share that when um, after I was elected and served on the school board for six years, I, I then came into the position of county supervisor. And for me, at least, it was always about, well, we're going to help every single person that comes through the door. But then you get into these positions of leadership, right? And you have to make tough decisions and you have to decide where are you going to allocate funds? And it's been a challenge. It's mm -hmm. been a challenge having those conversations on the diets. It's been a, a challenge having those conversations in closed session. And so for me, at least, it's really making sure that we make the invisible visible and that we continue to strive for resources, for connecting the dots, providing the opportunities that are needed. Um, I will share to one example that you mentioned, what are some of the challenges? And it is engagement. It is making sure that our community is civically involved and participatory in everything that we do. For example, there was an issue that came before the Board of Supervisors, and there was one individual who I won't name, but she's very active, very involved, very articulate. Well, she shows up to the Board of Supervisors and just stops and is silent and, and gets very muffled and, and because of the nervousness mm. of going into spaces like the Board of Supervisors or going into spaces like the City Council meeting um, or going into spaces where, again, tough decisions need to be made. But it is the people that we speak for or it is the people that we do the job uh, and so, again, being able to come into these spaces and know that your voice is heard, know that your voice is important, and that it's okay if, if, if there's still some work to be done. But, again, for me at least, is really making sure that we have a seat at the table. And like the adage has always said, if you're not um, on the table, you're on the menu. And so for us, it's really making sure that we can get into these spaces and, and create a collective consciousness where we can get things done. Okay. Maybe a follow-up question. <clears throat> the League of Mexican-American Women, if we're going to talk about civic engagement, can you give us some examples of what your organization has done to promote civic engagement uh, in that respect? Because I, in Madera County, that's one of the real issues that I see with the Latino community. We don't have anything close to a league of Mexican-American women uh, that is as effective, it seems to be the case here in Tulare County, as opposed to what's taking place in Madera, for example. So um, as an organization, we are nonpartisan. So we just encourage everybody to get out there and uh, use their votes, their voice to vote. Um, so some of the things that we do is we try to help uh, register people to vote. Uh, we make sure that we send out not, um, bilingual people to help register to vote. And um, the League of Women Voters here in Tulare County are very active. And anytime we do any type of uh, forum or anything like that, we always make sure that we're a part of it, that we um, make sure that there's translation available when there's a forum. And uh, we really try to get the advertisement and the word out that there is a forum happening in your community. And please take part, because if you have any questions for your future representative, that's the time to ask. So. Um, engagement with the community. Um, I know Lucia is very, 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 you know, she's always, hey, this weekend, let's go register people to vote. Let's go register people to vote. Let's go door to door. Let's canvas. Let's do that. And um, the Dolores Huerta Foundation is also very um, strong.
they're teachers or not. And so if they need any help from us, we're always there. And so I think a lot of it has to do with communication with other organizations because we're not the only ones that see the need. So if anybody lets us know that, hey, this community, nobody's been out there, we'll step up and we'll go out. Okay. Do you, you want to comment on that question, Sue? Um, well, I'll just say, like, from my uh, personal experience, I am not an anomaly, and I think that there are many people like me who are interested or want to get involved. And so we have to unearth their potential and the opportunity to bring them to the table. And so for me, at least, I, I see it as more of there's so much untapped potential in our communities, and especially with the next generation that is coming up with uh, their own interest in, in politics or their own interest in getting involved. And so we just have to make sure that organizations are visible um, and are out there so that way they can connect to the next generation as well. Okay, very good. Are there any question or a question from the audience? Yes. You want to tackle? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so I think with our culture, a lot of it has to do with um, we were raised to not really ask questions. We were just there. We're, we do, but we're not heard. We don't ask for things. We get them ourselves. So I think um, more Latinas growing up at this point are learning to speak up for themselves. to ask questions, to get out there, and not necessarily feel like that's not what we should be doing. Because I think it is very cultural for us to stay quiet and for us just to be happy that we're there without asking for anything. So I believe that the generations that are being raised and that, you know, that are coming up are very vocal and they're learning to make that space for themselves and others. And So one of the things that I'm doing is I'm changing the paradigm of politics. Um, so for the past four years, I always hosted these town halls. You know, uh, one of the first to start these town halls in the Board of Supervisors. And I realized that as I was meeting in Dow Colony or I was meeting in Ivanhoe, or I was meeting in all these uh, small communities, uh, there was a level of engagement, but there weren't many people in the room. But then I began to realize that I, I began working with the community of Ivanhoe, and Ivanhoe has their own community council. They are very powerful and mighty in the, the work that they do. And for the very, at the very beginning, I had asked the Ivanhoe Community Council, what are the top three things that you want to see in your community while I'm in office? And they mentioned the crosswalk, which we got done. They met, mentioned the turning lane on 328 because many times cars would zoom into town and and a lot of people were afraid of getting hit, so we did the turning lane. And then we're also working on the project, which is the sidewalk uh, on 160. And so I began to realize, like, I met them where they were at. They didn't have to come to a town hall meeting. And so one of my goals is, as I start my new term, is I'm going to go to these various communities. I'm going to say, you know what, let's meet once a month. You select some of your leaders that are in your community, bring anyone who is interested, 
and let's start identifying those issues um, and, and holding me accountable in order to make sure that those projects get done. So again, for me at least, it, it's taking a different approach and seeing what worked in the past four years and then being able to apply that for the next term. And again, that is to develop these community councils within their respective communities so that I can go in and tap into that potential as opposed to trying to come in with something and the community not really being connected with. Yes, in the back. Not only to be activists, to be leaders, to understand the organizations that hold us down or bring us up, we're not going to get too far. I mean, again, as has been said here, we have very few people that have made it up there, Lali being one of them and many of them. Um, but after that, then what? We need to have some sort of a mentorship program that starts you from zero and brings you all the way through to an optimal candidate for elections. It has to be looked upon that way. Otherwise, we're just getting people that do it on their own, like you, who strive to get up there and found those resources that understand the knowledge and has, has to grow the steam. The seeds are out there. We just haven't watered them. We haven't given them sun. Uh, and we have intended that though. We need to have that as opposed to just doing, doing, doing. We need to plant and see to grow. So, and I, I will share that that is the fault of many as leaders uh, that are in the county of Tulare. Um, and the reason why I say that that's a fault is because we haven't created a system in which we have workshop 101 um, or where we go out and go to these various communities to tap into the potential that these leaders are in these respective communities. But I will share the reason for that is because many of us are exhausted. <laughs> many of us are always on the day going and going, and, and so we don't take time to stop. We don't take time to give a, a, a lending hand and say, oh, here, come in out, <laughs> or here, you be part of this, or here. Because again, we're just so in the, the moment, we're in the grind, because we've been neglected for quite some time or trying to get the resources in my district that have been neglected for many years. So I'm, I'm tired of, uh, but at the same time, going and going and don't take time to reflect and engage and also collaborate. So again, I, that, that's something that I feel like as a leader, I need to do better at and get all of those other leaders in the room as well to really focus on that and to be able to apply that for the next generation through workshops and all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mavi? Uh, wait, wait. Elena, do we want to comment or go to the next? Okay. 
Uh, Lali, I think you had your hand up first. Excuse me. What I wanted to say is that Latino groups in this area have a history of being uh, ignored by the local community. For example, with the League of Mexican American Women, in the late 80s and 90s, we had the Junior League of Mexican American Women, and we established that so we could develop leadership and you know, and potential students and college students, because the league has always provided scholarships also. Um, two schools would let us in only. Rajelli Unified has been historically negligent of the Latino community. Um, they, two schools let us in to talk to the students, and that was La Jolla Middle School and Green Acres. And they would only allow us 20 minutes, only during lunch time. Remember, Norma? Mm -hmm. And we would, I would load up my car with artwork, with anything that we could. The students loved it, guys. The students loved the art, the music. And we would be in the parking lot so that we could use those 20 minutes. And then the students would run and help us put up the artwork. And then we had to put it down in 15 minutes. But that was what the schools were doing, discriminating against us. As of today, Barcelona Unified does not have a strong cultural groups for Latino students. The ballet classes that were here and the mariachi classes here, we have Louis Luna and Dr. Aguilar who were very instrumental in developing mariachi for students. We had to practice outside the schools the dance troops had to practice in garage. People who lend us, the people who had bigger homes would lend us their garage. Vicelia wouldn't lend us. Uh, remember, Norma? No, they wouldn't give us permission. They wouldn't give us, we were even willing to pay rent to use an auditorium. We wanted to use L.J. Williams and we would raise the money. No, we couldn't have it. We could not have that small auditorium. As of today, we cannot get it. That's why I in the fight, okay? Now, Porter, I mean, COS, same thing. The Puente program struggles to get the mentors. It's a wonderful project, the, the Puente project, wonderful. Every year we would struggle to get it going and to get the mentors and to get this and that. COS has never had a Latino strong program either. They're beginning to have things now. And we tried, some years we would have activity, then there was nothing for the next 10 years. They have a beautiful theater that's sitting there. We tried to get theaters, we tried to get Luis, but Luis Valdez wanted to come over here and help us. We could not get the theater at COS. It's sitting there. Okay, so this is today, same thing. I know there was a question in there. Yes, sir. I think you had your hand up. Yes. Yeah, I was going to ask, Eddie, do you think uh, leadership in Northern Slayer County could be maybe replicated in other areas? For those that don't know, maybe you could fill them in, Eddie, on that program. So, yeah, so I facilitated leadership in Northern Slayer County for three years. Um, and it, to uh, raise leadership awareness and capacity for mid-career professionals. And so those that just want to level up in their leadership uh, can go through a nine-month program uh, through the Dayuba Chamber of Commerce. We also have those uh, at Visalia, Porterville, and then in uh, Tulare. Uh, that's more specific towards just in terms of general leadership uh, capacity. Uh, but... I think that there is to be said that there could potentially be something similar, but focused on how we raise up the next generation of Latino leaders in the region. Um, but suffice to say, I think um, there are programs out there that people can tap into uh, in order to increase their yeah leadership capacity. Yeah, there, there are some out there, and I've seen them. Uh, uh, Dolores Rosa has a very wonderful program for uh,
speak of that puzzle that we, I mean, are not looking for one person to do it. We need to have a, a collective energy to be able to do the undertaking like this. It shouldn't be just on your back. No way could you do it. But there needs to be a consciousness through the leaderships of the different many organizations that those levels of skills need to be obtained for our community to have. I remember when I was in the newspaper business back in the 80s, looking at Lindsay and seeing what they were not, it was a, a cut, basically a, a very small uh, point of view of what was happening in the whole United States. When people were leaving the farm, uh, the farm work to go uh, to the flea marks, to move from the flea marks to have stores. Those are the first ones that Lindsay started having stores. But they didn't understand their local jurisdiction, the, the Chamber of Commerce. They didn't understand their business community. Those that did were family businesses that started up, grew, and then died out because those people died. The skills, we keep continuously losing those skills because we don't have an organization to hold it, whether it's business skills, leadership skills, political strategy skills, or anything like that, they, it goes with each generation passing. Yeah, so I, I agree with you in, in terms of trying to find a space in which you feel included in the framework of a vehicle to which a politicized consciousness is motivated through economic, political, and social justice. And so if there is an entity like that that can start developing and I will share with you, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm, um, uh, I believe in the opportunities that still exist in the county. So I will say just for, uh, again, sorry. She knows, uh, okay. Redistricting. So that happened two years ago, right? When we redistrict our entire county. Well, the state, guess who they were paying attention to? And the federal government. They were looking at Tulare. They were looking at Kern. They were looking at Fresno to see how we were going to draw the lines for the next 10 years. And there was already an ultimatum from the state to Tulare saying, hey, you need to make sure that your lines are reflective of the population and the people of the county. And so there was a struggle in the beginning, I will just share. <laughs> but ultimately, ultimately what we did is we increased our HCVAP, which means our uh, voting uh, percentages of Hispanics throughout the county, and making sure that there were at least at least three districts that are now competitive when it comes to the next election cycle. So mine has always been, thanks to the work that Lali Mojeno and her husband and others uh, did in order to make sure that the lines were representative, especially for uh, the northern